Well, again, good morning, church. So glad to see you guys that are here with us. And for those of you watching online, whether you're traveling or uh, still stuck with family after Thanksgiving, I don't know, maybe that happened somewhere. Um, we're so glad that you're worshiping with us today. Uh, let me just pause for a moment because I, I got to do it. Um, do we have any Alabama fans in the room? Okay. All right, go ahead. Give me a, give me a cheer. SEC champs. I'm, go ahead. Take it. I, I'm giving you a shot because when Georgia wins it, I'm going to bring it on you. All right, okay. All right, there it is, there it is. Um, man, a rough day for a lifelong Georgia fan like myself yesterday, uh, but the, the fact of the matter is we will have another day. And uh, one of these times, I don't, hopefully in my lifetime, Georgia's going to get a win. And when they do, you probably, you, well, you'll join us online that Sunday, I guarantee you, because I'm going <laughs> to... I'm going to bring the heat on you. Uh, another just good thing for me, for those of you who don't know me, uh, Baylor grad, lifelong Georgia fan, Baylor grad, Big 12 champs. So uh, you win some, you lose some. Uh, I'm happy about that. Uh, so, hey, glad that you are here today. We are celebrating Advent as we talked about. And as you heard in the announcements, we're going to be out on the front lawn December the 23rd. For those of you that are like, hold on now. I mean, isn't it the 24th that you do the candlelight? Yes, it normally is. The reason we're doing the 23rd is because we got rained out last year. We had to actually move it a day early, and it threw all of our plans out. So what we said this year is, well, let's just plan on the 23rd. That way, if we get rained out, we can still do the 24th. So it's going to be on the 23rd if it doesn't rain. If it does rain on the 23rd, it will be on the 24th, but it's going to be an amazing time. And we want you to invite all of your friends, all of your family, all of your neighbors. Uh, you don't want to miss what's going to happen out on the front line. But as we're counting down... God is giving us some amazing nuggets that we can hold on to. Last week, we talked about the hope of God that we can have. Hope is the confident expectation of good. It's the confident expectation that God sees you, knows you, has a plan for your life, and that no matter what you encounter in this life, no matter what trials you might face, you can know that God is with you, and he's wanting to lead you through it, and he's wanting you to live with hope. Not only is he wanting you to live with hope, but he's longing for you just to turn your heart to him and say, God, will you bring hope into my life? And then when you do that, when you give that invitation to Jesus, hope comes into our life. Now, today we're going to be talking about the next facet of Advent, and that is the facet of love. But before I do kind of get into the kind of the whole topic of love, uh, you need to know that I've watched entirely too much TV the last two weeks. When you're at home with COVID and you're in the basement and you're kind of quarantined from everyone, you know, you binge watch way too much TV, right? Anybody uh, been there just sick at home or maybe just binge TV when you're not sick? You just, it just happens, right? And so I've seen way too many TV shows and commercials and movies. And one of the commercials I saw this week, I just had to laugh. My wife and I both had to laugh. Maybe you've seen it. There's an AT&T commercial. And in the AT&T commercial, the, the girl says, she goes, you know, it's been a tough year and a half. And she said, everyone deserves something new. And I just want you to know that is theologically completely incorrect. I mean, just in case you didn't know, none of us deserve anything new. And in fact, this is what the scripture says about you and me. So I'm going to take us low. I'm going get, to get high at the end, but let me just kind of bring us all back to earth real quick. This is what the scripture says. All of us have sinned and we've fallen short of the glory of God. And because we've fallen short of the glory of God, the scripture says this, the wages of sin. So in other words, what you deserve and what I deserve is death, death. That's right, that's pretty bad news, right? So AT&T actually has it completely wrong. We don't deserve anything new. What we deserve is actually to be cut off from God and, for, and, and to be penalized for eternity. Now, because that's such a heavy theological thing, there's actually some good news that comes along in comparison to that. We may deserve death. We might not deserve anything good in our life, but God says, but you're worth everything. You don't deserve anything, but you are worth everything. And because you are so uh, have so much value to God, he actually sent his son to die for you and to die for me. Why did he do that? Because he loves us. Because he loves us, not because we deserved it, not because we earned it, not because we did something in, you know, in our good deeds or we gave enough money to a, a good cause or whatever it might be, not because we earned it, but because he loves us. We didn't deserve it. He gave his life for you and for me to make a way for us so that we can have a relationship with God. 
So every time you hear that AT&T commercial and you hear the girl say, you deserve something new, you can say, no, I don't, but I'm worthy of something because God gave his life for me. I'm worth everything to God. And that would be correct theology. That's the beginning of understanding love. And so this is where I want to go with this message today. I'm actually going to challenge all of us to be individuals that give love away no matter where we go. But to be able to give love away, especially when people haven't earned it, especially when they don't deserve it, then we have to know how much love we've received, how much we've been loved, so that there's something in the tank that we can actually give away. So let me just read a couple verses for us. I've just kind of quoted this one, paraphrasing it, but John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. And that whoever would believe in him would not perish, would not die, would not have the consequences of sin, would not get what you deserved, but rather you would have eternal life because God loved you. 1 John 4, 8, whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. This is not just something that God gives us, but it's something that he is. It is his being, is, is in his DNA to be one who loves us and to serve uh, you and me and even laid his own life down for us. First John 4, 19, we love then because he first loved us. That is the theological truth about love. You don't deserve anything. I don't deserve anything. We are, we are unworthy of, of deserving anything good in this life, but we're worthy in God's eyes. We have high value and worth and because he loves us and because he is love himself, he's poured that love out for you and for me. And we can actually live from that love. You know, the truth about being emotionally healthy is that when you operate in relationships of I'm going to meet you with what you give me, then we're all just going to end up in a downward spiral. Because everybody ends up at some place either being emotionally needy or just having an off day or something weird that you ate last night for dinner. And so if, if we're operating based off, of, well, I'll love you as much as you love me, or I, I'll give you as much grace as you give me, or I'll treat you as nicely as you treat me, then we all know we're in big trouble really fast. But if we operate not based on how other people act, and how other people treat us and what kind of love someone else might extend to us, but rather if we operate on an entirely different scale and level of things by saying, actually, my love for you and my love for my spouse and my love for my kids and my love for my coworkers is, is not dependent on anything that they do. It is actually just an overflow of what God has poured into my life. When we operate from there, then we begin to have something and operate from a place that is actually completely confusing to the world. They have no idea why Jesus followers can love in the face of hate. They have no idea why Jesus lovers, uh, Jesus, yeah, Jesus followers can love in the face of betrayal. They have no idea why Jesus followers can love no matter how someone might have treated them, even loving our enemies, right? Why and how can we love our enemies? Because God has poured his love into us. And so I want to look at a story that's a part of the Christmas story, kind of keeping with our theme, if you will, where there's a gentleman who encounters the, the love of God in his life. And he's in a relationship with a woman, and everything in him wants to walk away from that relationship. Everything in him says she's not worthy to be loved. But even being a man of honor, he's going to decide, hey, I'm, I'm going to put her away quietly. I'm not, I'm not going to make a big deal out of it. I'm not going to embarrass her. But because of what's gone on in this relationship, th this, is, this is over. But in this place of, of feeling like, mm, I want to put her away quietly, this particular gentleman by the name of Joseph is going to en encounter God, and let's see how he responds. We're reading in Matthew chapter 1, verse 18, and we're reading about the Joseph who would become the earthly father of Jesus and the husband of Mary. Mary, of course, had become pregnant. Uh, by the Holy Spirit, uh, which, of course, would throw any, uh, uh, any man in the room off. <laughs> if your uh, bride-to-be came to you and said, I'm pregnant by the Holy Spirit, you'd be like, yeah, right. You know, I mean, <laughs> none of us would believe that. And uh, so Joseph wasn't going to believe that either. So again, as I just said, he's decided to put her away quietly. He was a man of honor, um, but he had made up his mind. This, this relationship was over. And so let's pick up the story. Matthew... Um, Verse 1, chapter, excuse me, chapter 1, verse 18. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. 
His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had a mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid. We're talking in this Advent season about not having fear. You see, so many of the things in our lives and in our world are broken because we respond in fear in so many situations. We respond in fear to one another. We respond in fear in, re in relationships. And so in this moment of encountering God, this angel says, Joseph, don't have any fear. Are you living out of fear today? Are your responses to God fear-based? Are your responses to other individuals fear-based, fear of being hurt, fear of being let down, fear of being disappointed? Or are you choosing to fear not? The angel of the Lord reminds Joseph to not be afraid. He goes on, take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. All of this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. So in this place of, of kind of deciding on his own, hey, this is not a good situation. I'm going to put Mary away quietly. Joseph has a God encounter. How many of you know that God encounters are the most important things that can ever happen to you? In fact, we live by four words here at Cedar Crest, encounter, disciple, serve, and impact. And it begins with that first word, encounter, because we believe that it is the most important experience of your life to have a God encounter, to encounter the living God, not just to know some things about him, not just to, for those of you that are my age or a little older, have learned some things about him, maybe on a flannel board in Sunday school when you were a kid, you remember all those lessons, right? Those are good things. This is not, I'm not saying it's a bad thing. But just to know about him, but not truly experience him, is not at all what God intended for us. In fact, the scripture even says the demons know about Jesus. They even believe in him. They believe in Jesus. Demons do. But the difference between them and between a true follower is someone who's had that God encounter and says, God, based on encountering the living God, me personally with you, I'm forever changed. Will you take out the heart of stone Will you help me with my flesh patterns, the way that I kind of try to do things in my own strength, in my own brokenness? And that's the, the truth of the matter is, again, as I've been saying all morning, no matter how hard we might try, we all pick up broken habits along the way, and that's called your flesh. It's called trying to figure things out in your own strength. But when you have a true God encounter, you begin to understand, oh, actually, my ways, even if I think I've got something great, no, actually, I'm going to fall short. Even if I think my job's provided enough security, no, nope, that'll actually be taken from us one day as well. You know, as as, as the, the old preacher said, you never see a U-Haul following a hearse. What are they trying to say? You can't take it with you. No matter what you build up in this life, no matter how many toys, no matter how big your bank account is, that's not gonna go with you to the next life. That's all gonna eventually come to an end. There's only one thing that remains, and that is relationship with the living God, which comes through encounters with the living God. Have you had an encounter with the living God? The way it begins is just by being open to him. Perhaps you're sitting here this morning going, man, I'd, I'd love to have an encounter with the living God, but I don't know that I've ever had that. It just begins with a simple prayer of, God, I'm, I'm putting my heart in a posture this Advent season. Would you encounter me? Would you reveal yourself to me? Would you show up in the mundane places in life? Would you be evident in my marriage? Would you be evident in, with my kids? Would you be evident as I go to school and try to finish these finals here at the end of the semester? God, would you, would you encounter me? When you pray that kind of prayer, God shows up. And so it said here in our scripture that Joseph was a man who respected the law. He, he understood kind of the, the things of God, but he was due a God encounter. He was due actually knowing God. And so the angel of God shows up and says, Joseph, have no fear. And then he gives him some instructions to follow. He says, don't put away Mary. And so in verse 24, here at the end of uh, chapter one, it says, when Joseph woke up from this dream, 
He did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him, and he took Mary home as his wife. What do we see? We see, number one, that Joseph chose to say no to fear. He had an opportunity to continue to live fear-based, to say, well, she's pregnant, and I don't know how, and you know, we don't have like DNA testing back in these days, and so there, there was no way to try to figure out, hey, did, did somebody down the street get my fiance pregnant? There, there's just purely a decision to make. Am I gonna live fear-based or not? Well, I say no to fear, like the angel of God has encouraged me to do in this God encounter, or will I give in to fear? And Joseph said no to fear. Are you saying no to fear in your own life? The second thing that we see is that Joseph chose to trust God. Not only did he say no to fear, but he said, I'm gonna trust you, God. You see, it's one thing to, to say no to the bad things in life, but if you end up just kind of gritting your teeth and saying, oh, I'm not gonna be fearful today. <laughs> I'm not gonna give in to anxiety today. <laughs> just kind of gritting your teeth. You're really just kind of like, just heading into a nosedive right into it. You need something different to focus on. And so Joseph said, I'm gonna say no to fear, but I'm gonna turn my attention now to God himself and I will put my trust there. I'm not just gonna grit my teeth and say, oh, don't worry about it. I'm gonna say, God, I need you today. And so he chose to trust the word of God. Are you choosing to trust the things that God says about who you are? Are you choosing to trust the ways that God invites you to order your life and to structure your life? You see, the, the things of God, the boundaries of God that we have in his word are, are not to somehow kind of destroy all your joy. In fact, we're gonna be talking about joy next week, so I'll say more about that later. But actually, the, the ways of God are intended to free you up. They're intended to make this life something that makes sense. All of a sudden, the purpose of your, of your life become, becomes much more clear because now you're living in the way that the creator created you and others to experience life. Are you choosing to trust him in that and walk in that? It matters not that we just say no to the bad things in life, but that we say yes to God. Good moral people say no to the bad things all the time, but Jesus people are able to say no to the things that destroy us and yes to God. I trust you, God. Are you saying yes to God? The third thing that Joseph did after saying no to fear and choosing to trust God, he chose to love. He chose love. How many of you know, as I said just a second ago, there was no way for Joseph to prove how Mary was pregnant. There's no way to prove it. Now, obviously, having a, a God encounter in a dream, that, that makes a difference, and that kind of helps a brother out a little bit. But, you know, Joseph is just like you and me. When you wake up the next morning, immediately, I'm sure, the enemy of God began to drop those seeds of doubt. Oh, Joseph, that was just a dream. That wasn't really God. God didn't really talk to you. You don't have to love her. Put her away. The enemy of God would have been doing everything he could to drive a wedge between Mary and Joseph. So Joseph had a choice. He said, I'm, I'm choosing to trust God, and not only that, I'm choosing to love Mary. I'm choosing to love Mary. He chose it, not because Mary was able to convince him somehow that she was pregnant by the Holy Spirit, but because it was a choice that he made. She hadn't necessarily earned it. Now, history would prove out that it was definitely of God, and we know the story, at least many of us do, and we'll be talking about that later this month. But remember, in the moment, before Jesus was born, before the wise men show up from the east, before the greatest movement to ever sweep the earth has ever taken place, we're just talking about a man and a woman living in the armpit of the world, and she's pregnant, and it's not by him. He has a dream. He chooses to trust God, and now he has to choose to love Mary, and he chose it. And man, I'm sure if we could interview Joseph today, he would say, I'm so glad I chose to love Mary. I'm so glad I chose love. Why? Well, because he ended up being the earthly father of the Messiah, the one who would change eternity for every single one of us. What a pleasure to be able to watch Jesus grow up and to be able to watch how his life would be shaped by his heavenly father and to get to have a front row seat to that as his earthly father. All of that would have been lost and would have been thrown away had Joseph not chosen to love even when he didn't feel like loving. He felt like putting her away, but he didn't give in to kind of what he felt like she earned or what she deserved. 
He gave in to choosing God's way, choosing to love her because God had affirmed it. Love is not something they earn. It's something we give. Let me say that again. Love is not something they earn. It's something that we give. So are you loving in such a way that uh, is from God or are you loving in such a way that's kind of meeting where somebody else might be living? That makes sense. Are you loving at a level which maybe you feel like they deserve? Are you loving at a level where God has poured out so much love into your life, you know so much about your own identity that you can't help but give it away to others? I told you I've been watching too much TV. Let me tell you about a movie that, that I watched while I was at home in my basement. I would recommend this movie uh, to you. If, if you got Amazon Prime, you can watch this for free right now. Uh, but the movie is called Same Kind of Different as Me. Same kind of different as me. It's a great kind of holiday uh, movie to watch. Um, I don't know about a family, but for sure teenagers and up um, would be a great story. There's so many themes. There's some racial tension in there. There's some socioeconomic uh, issues that are wrestled in there. But there's also a part of the story, and this is a true story, by the way, is a story of a husband and a wife. And at the very beginning of the movie, we, we begin to, it becomes clear to us that um, these two individuals, uh, their names are Ron and Debbie Hall, um, they have kind of a successful life on the outside, but their marriage is not doing well. In the first part of the story, we find out pretty quickly that Ron is having an affair. And so one of Debbie's friends walks up to Ron at a Christmas party uh, um, and says, if you don't tell her, I'm going to. You better tell her what you're doing. I know what you're up to. And so Ron goes home uh, that particular night, and in the movie, it turns to a scene where the two of them are just having it out as Ron's sharing with Debbie that he's cheated on her, that he has not been true to loving her uh, in the way that she deserved to be loved. But there's this powerful moment. You see, Debbie was a believer, and they have it out, but there's this powerful moment where everything shifts. And I remember as I was sitting there watching this, I remember thinking, this is so much how Jesus would respond in this moment. I'm sure she is hurting. I'm, I'm sure she's mad. And no, she did not deserve to be treated this way. And in fact, it, you know, this is biblical grounds for them to, to go separate directions. I mean, he's broken the, the marital bond between the two of them. But Debbie chooses love in this moment. And I want to just read for you a, a little snippet of a scene because there's this powerful scene where she, sa she says, Debbie says to Ron, what's her phone number? sitting there in the room. It's just the two of them. And she, what's the girl's phone number that you've been seeing? And Ron takes out his cell phone and he goes to the contact of this lady he's been having an affair with and he just hands, her, hands his phone to Debbie. And Debbie takes the phone in, in her hand. She looks at it for a moment and she clicks dial. Now, I don't know about you, but when I was watching the movie, I was like, ooh, she's fixing to rip into this lady right now, Right? And she gets on the phone, and you don't ever hear another voice on the other side. All you hear, I'm going to read this to us, is you hear Debbie say, don't hang up. Hello, don't hang up. This is Ron's wife. I just want you to know that I don't blame you and that I forgive you. And I hope you will find someone that truly loves you like Ron and I used to love each other. Listen to this. If we can find that again, you won't be hearing from my husband anymore. Okay, bye. And she hangs up. And then she looks at Ron and she says, you can leave or you can stay. And she chooses love in a moment of great pain, in a moment of him not being worthy of it, him not deserving it. Him having not earned it, she says, I'm going to commit myself to this if you want it, but it's your choice. And Ron takes the phone back from his wife, and he sits there for a second, and he looks at his wife, Debbie, and he says, I choose you. I choose you. And the rest of the movie is them. I won't give away the rest of it, but the rest of them is Ron and Debbie working on putting their marriage back together. It's them choosing to love, not because someone had earned it or deserved it, but because they knew of God's love for them. And because God had filled them up, there was something on the inside that they had to give away to each other. And it's a beautiful story. Again, it's a true story, and I would encourage you to 
to watch the movie at some point this Christmas just to have your heart stirred and encouraged again for what it means to truly love, not out of what somebody has done to us, but because of what God has done for us. Nobody deserves it, but we're worthy of God's love because he puts value on us. You've been called to love even when you don't feel it. You've been called to love even when you don't feel it. I love how Martin Luther King Jr. said it this way. He said, I've decided to stick with love because hatred is too heavy a burden to bear. You know, we need in this world men and women of God that will choose to love, even when people don't deserve it. You know, choosing to love when somebody cuts you off on the interstate, that's a moment of choosing to love. You know, you could respond in the flesh. You could respond by, man, you know, rolling your window down, letting them have it, giving them the middle finger, whatever it is that you might want to do in your own flesh. Come on, let's get real. This is, you know, I know it's church, but let's be real. Somebody cuts us off, we get mad about that. What about when somebody's rude to you at a place where you're shopping or uh, perhaps at a restaurant or fighting over a parking space as you're going to buy those Christmas gifts and somebody pulls into that spot or, or yells at you and tells you off because you pulled in the parking spot. There's so many different little places in life where right now, you and me as followers of Jesus, we have decisions to make. Am I gonna give love away today? Am I gonna be one who speaks hope and love into other people? Or am I gonna respond by, you know, I'm gonna get them, you know, I'm gonna twist the knife, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stick them. I, I, I don't. I, don't, I wanna bring, this is not what they do. They don't deserve love. They deserve anything bad coming to them. Or will we be people that at home, at the university, at work, we're just love dealers. Hope and love just coming out of us wherever we go. And people would look at you and say, man, I, I don't get it. There's something, there's like a well on the inside of them that I don't know where it comes from, but they just seem to be over flowing with love towards others, even when people don't deserve it. What is that? And may it be a testimony of your life that people see Jesus coming out of you. And when even, even when people don't deserve it, you have the courage to choose love. Hey, I'm not saying that we just allow people to, you know, run over us in life and that we don't have any healthy boundaries. Of course, having healthy boundaries in life is appropriate, and we don't just knowingly let people take advantage of us over and over and over again. So please have healthy boundaries, I'm, you know, all the things, right? But in the midst of having healthy boundaries, you and I can still choose to love. We can still choose to forgive. We can still choose to walk in the strength that God would give us. So here's what I wanna do as we close our service today. I'm gonna pray for all of us in the room because I don't know about you, but I need more of God's love on a daily basis. I need to be reminded of his love for me. But there's some of you in the room today that as I was talking earlier about that God encounter, you've never experienced God's love for the very first time in your life. You've never truly had it sink down from up here into here, into your heart, that you are loved by God. And there's a, a, just a moment of time right now that we have with one another. We're not promised tomorrow. I don't know that we'll be able to see each other next week. Maybe you'll be out of town. Maybe you'll never come back to Cedar Crest Church. I don't know. But right now, we have this moment where we can invite Jesus to touch you right where you need to be touched by his love. In fact, Jesus gives us this picture in Scripture that he stands at the door of our life and he knocks. And if we open the door, he comes in and he brings fellowship and he pours out his love. So what we see in Scripture is very clearly that it's actually a decision that we make to receive this free gift of love that God pours out for us. It's something that he's done, he's accomplished on the cross, he wants to give you love, but it's not something that will ever sink down into your heart until you make the decision to open the door and say, God, I invite you in right now. So would you just bow your heads just for a moment and close your eyes? We had a baptism a few weeks ago and one of the young men said, you know when the pastor said no peeking? I lifted my hand in that moment. So this is a no peeking moment because individuals are gonna meet God right now as we're praying. And here's what I just wanna invite you to do. If you know you need the love of God in your life this morning, would you just, as everyone's head are bowed, would you just lift your hand up? It's a way of saying, God, I need your love in my life. Thank you. Just hold them up just for a second. Just lift your hand up. I can see your hand and God can see your hand. Thank you. Would you put your hands down? Thank you. 
There's so many of us in the room this morning that are saying, God, I need to know your love. And so here's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to pray right now and invite the love of God to flood your heart as you mentally are opening the door of your life. There's a spiritual transaction that's happening where the love of God is going to pour into you. So let's just pray together. God, thank you this morning for your love. Thank you that we see it modeled by you, Lord Jesus, in the way that you laid your life down for us. Thank you that we see it from other individuals in scripture like Joseph who chose love. He chose to love Mary even when it wasn't clear what the situation was. And Lord, this morning we've got some friends in the room that would say, God, I need to first know your love. I, I can't love others unless I've encountered your love for me. Perhaps you're hurting this morning and maybe you someone has kind of run you over emotionally or has taken advantage of you and you just feel low on the ability to love others today, just right now, just invite him in. God, would you come right now as individuals are opening the door of their life to you. God, would you come in with your love? Would you come in and affirm the value and worth on any single person that can hear my voice that's saying, God, would you come right now? Lord, thank you that you pour out your love. Thank you that you are love. Thank you that the Holy Spirit is the reminder of your love. And so God, I'm asking that hearts should be changed today. There would be that deep well of overflowing love that comes up from the inside when we've encountered the living God so that we have something to not only sustain us, but even more than that, we have something to give away to those around us. God, would you fill our tanks up today to overflowing? And for any single person that's calling on your name right now, Lord, we ask for a God encounter. We ask for the love of God to be poured into them. And we thank you for it. If you just prayed that prayer with me, and again, just keep your eyes, uh, your eyes closed and your heads bowed for a moment. If you just prayed that prayer with me, I wanna encourage you to go to cedarcrestchurch.com slash response. All that is is a little form that would enable one of our pastors to follow up with you. We want to help you take the next steps of following Jesus, and we can put some tools in your hand that will help you uh, continue on the journey so that it doesn't have to be just one moment, but it can be a lifetime of living in God's love. So if that's you, we would encourage you, cedarcrestchurch.com slash response. But now for everyone, I just pray the blessing of God over you. For this week to come, may you be a people that live in the hope of God the confident expectation of good. May you be the people that live in the love of God, knowing that you are worth so much to God. You are, uh, the, the value can't even be, we can't even put a, a figure on the value. You are, um, in, I mean, just the, the apple of God's eye. I'm trying to put even words to it in my prayer. He just looks down at you and he says, oh, I love you so much. You're so valuable to me. I, I long to be near to you and to spend time with you. I long to help you with that situation that you're dealing with. Just invite me into it. I want to give you the wisdom that you need. Just invite me into it. He's not put off by you. In fact, he longs to just come near to you. Like a father coming near to one of his beloved children is his heart for you today. And so I pray that the revelation and the knowledge of that into your spirit today, I just, by the power of the Holy Spirit, I just infuse you right now with love overflowing, love to trust again, love to believe again, love to give away to others even when they haven't earned it, love that only comes from God. May you be an ambassador of love, carrying it wherever you go this week. And I pray that love would ring in your life. I pray that you would come across the word, that you would see it in the scriptures, that you would see it on Christmas cards, that you would see it on AT&T commercials, that you would see it wherever you go. Love, love, love. You are loved by God, and therefore you are sent out to be one who gives love away to others in the name of Jesus. And I bless you with that today. May you be blessed to be a blessing to others. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.